Hello and thanks for joining us here on Tech24, I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, we'll tell you more about the race to build the world's first space elevator. The idea is simple, create a 100,000 kilometer long tether stretching from Earth to space that we would climb, a much cheaper way to reach and explore the universe. And in Test24, we'll try the Anatoscope, a scanner that can automatically build a 3D advanced model of a patient's anatomy in just one minute. It's opening up the way for personalized treatment. But first, I'm very pleased to welcome on set French-American entrepreneur and author Géraldine Lemeur. Thank you so much for being with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, you started your first company when you were just 23 years old, and today you run the Refiners, a San Francisco-based uh, seed fund program. In your book that just came out in French and mm -hmm. is about to be adapted into English, you tell us more about 30 or so French women and how they decided to become entrepreneurs. Why did you feel the need to write this book? Well, I really wanted to demystify entrepreneurship and the way we can uh, find a path to success for women. And I really wanted to anchor this into our real lives. So just like no, uh, I mean, nothing uh, out of reality. So I shared with the book uh, this path, those women stories and, uh, and the way they kind of uh, went through all their life, personal and professional, uh, either being entrepreneurs or those who decided to join companies. And now this glass ceiling, it's, it's not an illusion uh, in all sectors, but also in the tech sector. Um, are there some areas, though, in the tech sector that are more open to women than others? Well, I think historically women uh, were more uh, like into marketing or uh, communication, uh, which was great and it's still great. But we really need to find a path to go through, uh, through that and to go in tech. Because um, obviously when we develop AI, and all the algorithm, we cannot let men only lead that path. So we need women to embrace those careers. Uh, we see in the US a lot of uh, girls going into data uh, studies and uh, statistics, for instance. There is a growing, um, I mean, a growing numbers of girls going in, uh, in uh, colleges in the US into that path. We could be the in between, uh, between coding and, and also being uh, really involved in, uh, in data. And do you think things are easier for women here in Europe or in the United States, in Silicon Valley in, in specific? Well, I'm not sure it's easier, uh, I mean, uh, in any country, but maybe in France, if I take the example in France, there is uh, something that's going on, uh, which is uh, somehow uh, easier. And if we look at, for instance, the board's uh, membership, well, we have uh, a law in France, 50-50 uh, women and men uh, in, uh, in, uh, in boards. Uh, whereas uh, in California, this law passed like uh, early, uh, early uh, September or mid-October. Mid, mid so there is something uh, different. Um, I don't think it's easier. Uh, and we've, when we look at the stats, uh, we see that it's, it's kind of the same statistics everywhere. So Geraldine, what's the best way to shatter this gender gap? Is it uh, the fact of having role models to inspire women? Is it affirmative action policies? How do you see things going forward? I'll, I think role models are definitely something very important. People grounded in reality, so not just like stars, and uh, which are very, I mean, they're very inspiring, but you want to have people who say, oh, this is the woman I can be. Uh, and the other thing is also education. I think education is key. And if we don't find the path in education to inspire girls in, in going to the STEM uh, uh, careers or, or studies, uh, then it's going to be very difficult. And briefly, what's the main advice you would give to women out there who want to start their own company? Oh, if you don't play the game, you can't win it. So it's, it's just, it's really a motto I have. And uh, it's, it's really about saying yes. And yes, I want to try and I'll find my path rather than no, I can't do it. Very well. Geraldine Lemeur, thank you so thank much you. for that. Moving on now to a whole other topic. Willy Wonka's glass elevator is getting one step closer to reality. Engineers in Germany are currently developing a lift that can travel both vertically and horizontally. According to experts, this technology will be crucial in the future as skyscrapers increasingly take over our city. Selena Sykes reports. Today, taking a lift is part of most people's daily routine. At the touch of a button, we're transported up several floors in seconds. But the experience is set to change radically. This is the lift of the future. With no cables, it can travel vertically and horizontally. The technology is being tested in this tower in the German countryside. 
an unprecedented project run by lift manufacturers and engineers. This isn't a small step, it's a complete revolution. The system is completely different, nothing like traditional cable lifts. Transporting people is the only thing they have in common. The lift cabin moves around using electromagnetic suspension technology, traveling in different directions using magnetized coils, which makes it easier to move around a large building quickly. And in big cities, architects are building upwards, with skyscrapers reaching up to 800 meters. The problem, traditional lifts weighed down by their cables can't travel higher than 400 meters, meaning several lift shafts and cabins are needed to reach the top. But with new cableless lift technology, this German manufacturer says the sky's the limit. We know that in 15 years' time, there'll be nearly 2 billion more people on Earth. Our cities will have more and more people living in them. We need to build upwards. We need to find a solution. When one lift cabin blocks another, it can move left or right out of the way, like trains in a metro, which arrive at the quest of users. You can choose the floor using your phone. The lift can also automatically know where you're going because you get off at the 70th floor every day. And on the way, the lift will take people who want to go to the same place. As there are several cabins, we can create new ways to get around. Engineers are adding the final touches before the new lift is put on the market. And there's no time to waste. A developer is planning to install a cableless lift in a tower in Berlin in 2021. And I'm now joined on set by our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. And believe it or not, we are going to keep on talking about elevators, but this time the elevator is going to take us into space. That's right. The space elevator concept, you'll be surprised. It's not a really new idea because, in fact, it was in 1895 that uh, the father of rocketry, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, he imagined the Eiffel Tower to stretch into space, and then it goes on and on, and finally it gets attached to a celestial castle in a geosynchronous orbit. Now, space elevator concept is somewhat parallel to it, and that celestial castle can be imagined to be a space station in a geosynchronous orbit, which is around 35,000 kilometers uh, from Earth. As you can see in the images, uh, there's a tether. So this space station gets tethered to a point on our planet on the equator. Right. And at the other end of this tether is another anchor. So it becomes, it remains taut. And then an elevator, it zips up and down this cable. Uh, it and will so be powered by laser. It? You can transport people, people you can transport cargo at a fraction of a price, uh, say by uh, or using a space uh, shuttle or even uh, the rockets that are used currently. But of course, there are multiple challenges. And the biggest challenge is to develop materials to make this cable because it has to withstand the atmospheric conditions of our planet and the gravity forces, not just of the Earth, but of the sun and the moon as well. And now let's stay in space and talk about the Bepi Colombo spacecraft that has just been launched into space. It's on a seven-year voyage to Mercury, a place that is often described as a hellish place. Well, it's a very interesting planet because it's the closest planet to the sun. And by studying Mercury, we might get insights on how the planetary system was formed. Secondly, Mercury has an intrinsic magnetic field, which is surprising because bigger planets like Venus, Mars, and even the moon, they don't have intrinsic magnetic fields. And Scientists are hoping that they will also be able to study interactions, magnetic interactions between the Sun and Mercury. So this uh, mission consists of two orbiters, one developed by the European Space Agency, which will map and image Mercury. And the second is uh, an orbiter developed by the Japanese Space Agency, which will have a magnetometer and it will make studies of the magnetic environment of Mercury. And, and Mercury is also very important because it was the motion of Mercury, the orbit of Mercury around the, around the Sun, uh, that was accurately explained by the general, the, by the theory of general relativity uh, in 1915, which was developed by Albert Einstein. So hopefully these uh, missions, uh, these two orbiters will be able to take more observations to verify the theory of general uh, relativity to a higher accuracy. Thank you, Dan and Jay. We're going to move on now to test 24. And this week on Test24, we take a look at an imaging solutions developed by a Montpellier-based startup, and it's opening the way for personalized treatment. Dan, what are some of those solutions? Well, Julia, before I talk about the solutions, we should know that until now, medical practitioners use imaging from CT scan or MRI for diagnosis and treatment. 
But this startup, Anatoscope, they have developed a software and with a bit of help uh, from machine learning, uh, they are able to use all these images and create a 3D identical twin of patients. Now, what this means, uh, means is that uh, the, the medical practitioners are able to simulate the motion of the part that, like that are to be treated. Mouth That's right. right. There. So there are two main uh, fields, uh, for example, dentistry and orthopedics. So you can test those devices digitally using this software before manufacturing them so that you can verify that if it fits well, if you know the motion is not affected too much, and then once it's confirmed, then you can uh, manufacture these parts. So first of all, these can be designed in literally minutes. As you mentioned, it takes uh, a minute or so to design some of these parts. And secondly, it also results in uh, saving time, saving energy, and ensuring accuracy. So we have some examples here. So this is an example of... Uh, like of a cast, a, almost? Yeah, exactly. So if there's a problem with uh, the with a foot uh, of a baby, for example, if it's malfunctioning, then this is a cast that helps us helps it to reset. Then to strain it. Exactly. Right. There is the helmet or a head gear that is also used for uh, so for treatment of. You use 3D printers for that, right? Yeah, you can. Once. This has been printed uh, using 3D printers, but you can manufacture them by other ways as well. So this is for babies with uh, which have a malformation of the head. Right. So these are some of the examples. Dan and Jay Cattle Car there. Thank you for that. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24, but you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time.